Good, it's so good to be home. You know, those of you who know me, I'm born and raised in Oakland, California, so. Uh, I love Aaron so much. Having as him a friend is such a gift. He taught me the greatest thing about a playwright. Somebody asked him a question, what does it take to be a playwright? And he said, you have to love people. And I share that with everybody around the world. So it's just a, such an honor to get this, uh, receive this gift from him. I'm gonna try to be short because I know people are hungry and they wanna drink alcohol and talk about Hillary Clinton. Short as possible. Bear with me. It is an honor to be here. There is no greater gift than to be celebrated at home. You can leave home, but you always take home with you. You don't have to pack it. Home jumps on your back. It gets in your bones. And you can't wash it off or have a home transplant. <laughs> and that's a good thing. I got in a cab on the way here, and this is a true story. And I told the cabbie, I said, I need you to go really fast without breaking the law, killing me, are getting a ticket uh, and save me 10 or 15 minutes. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you're from California. <laughs> and I said, how do you know? And he says, oh, you're from the Bay Area. And he said, because only people from the Bay Area question it. People from LA just shake their head yes. And he said, I can tell because you have an accent. And so I never heard that before. Apparently, we all have an accent. <laughs> Home gets in your mouth. When people from back home celebrate you, all of your past history comes into focus, and you feel like you've been lifted in the air by your entire town, like they did in Rocky. <laughs> I wanna thank Berkeley Rep and Tony Taccone for producing the play and for being long supporter of my work. I wanna thank Shotgun Players for inspiring all the work that I do in communities and for being a leader in the Green Movement. I wanna thank San Francisco Mind Troop, which is where I got my start as a playwright and they really taught me a passion for activism and what it means to create political theater. I truly want to thank the critics who all said wonderful things about me. That has never happened in my life. <laughs> it feels really good. <laughs> and I want to thank Theater Bay Area, and I want to thank you all for being here. I was asked to speak on being the change, our theme, if you will, for the conference. I know you have been hearing this phrase dissected all day long, so I won't do that much surgery. I will simply state that what it means to me and then we can go eat. So the two things that really drive me crazy is that people say often, especially in our industry, is that theater is dead and that theater can't change lives. I know why they say these phrases. Theater is hard to make. It takes a lot out of you. It seems to be driven by money or greed. It takes a selfless heart. It does not reward innovation often enough. And there are a lot of tend to be old white people who sit in the seats and all they really want to see is Shakespeare. <laughs> but this doesn't mean that theater is really dead. It simply means that theater could be in a coma. <laughs> but theater cannot die because as long as someone, anyone is making it, it is a living, breathing, wonderful beast full of possibility and impossibility. When you write a play, you give birth to theater. When you dramaturg a play, you nurse theater. When you direct a play, you help theater across the street. When you produce a play, you give theater a full ride to college. When you act in a play, you fall in love with and make love to and marry theater. And when you watch a play, or if you're an organization that produces and supports play, then you become part of the procreation of theater. You're essentially exercising the profound, fragile, and necessary circle of life. It cannot die as long as we live. So when someone tells you that theater is dead, check their pulse. <laughs> if you find life, then remind them that theater is alive because so are they. And if they think that theater is sick or dying, tell them to do something about it. Tell them to create change. What does it mean to be the change? First, let's look at the word be. When Shakespeare talked about the word be in Hamlet, he said, of course, to be or not to be. And that be refers to living, to live or not to live. Likewise, the African-American tongue has embraced this be and defines it, defines it as a state of being. My pages are all, let's get it on. I'm gonna just freestyle this for a minute. <laughs> so in my culture, in African-American culture, people often say, you be tripping. 
right? Which means you were tripping when I met you, you're tripping right now, and you're probably gonna be tripping next week. <laughs> it means that's how I identify this a state of being. You are always tripping. And what it charges you is it also charges you to change. If, it's, if someone says you, you be something and it, it's not favorable, they're asking you to change. So when I think of be the change, that's what I, that's what I, essentially what I'm thinking. First, we have to understand our gift. When we're talking about to be the change, we have to first understand what is our gift in order to make change. So when I was growing up, there were two people in my inner circle, in my family, in my family circle, who really inspired me to be artists. One was Sister Cheney, who was no longer with us, and my other was my Uncle Kurt, who was also no longer with us. And I never forget Sister Cheney was about this tall, and she had her, felt like her skin was made of honey, and she had eyes like Werther's Originals, you know, those, mm. those eyes are so pretty, you could eat them or kiss her eyelids. And um, she never talked, she always sung. Everything that came out of her mouth was she sung. She was like music in the flesh. And she played the piano at my church. And when she played the piano, she played it so well. When she got up, you swore smoke was rising out of the piano. <laughs> and, I, and what she did to audiences in church was, she was so powerful on the organ and on the piano that people would shout and they would scream, they would cry, they would shake, they would tremble, they would fall on the floor. And I said, I want to do that. <laughs> and likewise, my Uncle Kurt, who lived right next door to us when I was growing up in West Oakland on Linda Street, he, would, uh, he was famous because he played with James Brown and Miles Davis. He played the trumpet. And Uncle Kurt was a husky guy who was bald, and he smoked these really, really stinky cigars. And he had a, I swear, a mole with a hair follicle growing out of the mole that looked like a half note of music. <laughs> and so he was also made of music, music in the flesh. And he would sit in his car, this old Cadillac that could not run. And he would sit in his car and he would literally all day rock to love supreme culture all day long. And I said, I want to do that. <laughs> And so I had a great opportunity. I, my mother was this amazing, she still is this amazing person. She didn't believe that children couldn't do whatever they wanted to do. So even though my parents were very poor, I said, my mom wanna learn how to play the piano. She had no money. So she said, well, we just have to figure out a way to get you piano lessons. And so she asked Sister Cheney if she would teach me how to play the piano. And it was the way she asked Sister Cheney that Sister Cheney immediately responded, I'm gonna give him lessons for free. And so every Saturday, she would pack my backpack up with my music book, and I would bring Sister Franny, a, a Sister Chain, an Asian pair. She loved Asian pairs. And I would bring her an Asian pair, and that was my little gift to her, to, uh, for her to teach me to play the piano. And um, I was horrible, let's just be honest. I was really, really bad. It was not my gift. And uh, I would sit down, and in her very sweet singing voice, she would just walk away and say, baby, I'll be back. <laughs> And, uh, but she never gave up on me. She really stood by me. And what she slowly realized was I wanted to touch people, but that was not my gift, my way to touch people. And so I never forget, we had a Christmas concert and I really wanted to impress my Uncle Kurt because he was the musician that everybody loved in my family, like I mentioned. And all I had to do was play Jingle Bells. Um, so she really worked, God bless her, she really worked with me to try to get all of Jingle Bells out, but I could only get Jingle Bells, Jingle All the Way, that was it. <laughs> That's all I could get out. And the rest, I just couldn't, I mean, I understood how to play the rest, but my spirit, something within me was improvising. And I would just go off on these, you know, tangents. I wanted to play like her immediately and have smoke rising out the piano. <laughs> and so I rehearsed, 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 and uh, the day I, I played before my brother, and I remember him saying, because my family, they're very critical. I have a massive family, you probably know, I'm sure you all know somebody I'm related to. My dad has 10 sisters, my mother was raised with 11, and all of them have children. So I have a massive family, they all live here. And they're very critical. And so he said, they're gonna eat you up, You're gonna, they're gonna destroy you. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I went out there and I played my heart out and I got those two lines that I knew, those two bars, I got those out, and then the rest, I did my whole culture and thing. <laughs> and you know, everybody dropped, I heard silverware dropping, you know, everybody was shaking their head. And I was, as it was happening, I was watching it and I was thinking, oh my God, this is the worst day of my life. And after it was over, nobody clapped, but Uncle Kurt, <laughs> who stood up, leaped, I never forget, he leapt, he never stands, he leapt 
and just uh, screaming and grovel and clapping at the, uh, as hard as he could. And uh, I felt so proud in that moment. I went up to him, I said, Uncle Kurt, you love, you love it? He said, no, boy, that was terrible. <laughs> he said, but you improvised. He said, you poor son of a bitch, you're an artist. <laughs> so much for instilling me the gift. I knew I was an artist, I just didn't know what I was destined to do. Once you realize your gift, you have to activate it. We talked about that earlier. It's not just talk, we can't just talk about what we wanna do and what we're supposed to do in the world, but you have to go out and do it. By nature, theater artists are communicators, but words have no real power until they actually do something in the world. A play is not a play until it actually gets lifted off the page and put into our mouths and put in front of people. If you see a need in the world that can, be, that can heal people, a story that can heal our community, it is for you to tell it. If you see a community or a subculture that is in need, it is for you to help feel, fulfill that need. We have to activate change. Don't let anyone tell you that what you do is just for fun or that it cannot actually start a movement or heal a broken heart or make somebody think differently about how they see the world. If freedom can be gained because a man refused to eat, until justice was served, or another man marched in the streets against bully clubs, police dogs, and water hoses, and never lifted a finger in retaliation until justice was served. If a woman can travel all over the country telling people that men are being hung from trees and refuses literally to stop until justice was served, and if a man can fight against apartheid and then serve most of his life in a prison and then get released and become the president of the same country, then imagine what you can do in your community when you face, when you're faced with something that is smaller, much more possible, and you have the strength and the gift to make change in your community. You must be it, live it, and do it for the right reason. Recently, I was doing a production of this epic trilogy called The Road Weeps. We had a national tour of it last year. And everywhere we stopped, it was very, very hard to present this material in front of audiences. It was very dense but also we just never had a time to really make the show. Each stop along the way had a different cast, a different director, different designers. And so the play never quite made the traction that it needed. And then we arrived at a specific location and I was depressed because I had really high hopes for this show. And uh, I thought my gift that I was now activating did, wasn't penetrating the audience. And um, I never forget there was a talk back the next day and then I was gonna fly back home to Harlem. And I didn't wanna to go to the talk back and I called the artistic director and I said, look, I can't do it, I'm too depressed. This play is not doing what I needed to do in the community. He said, you need to come to this talk back because people wanna talk about this play. So I came and there was very few people in the audience and I you know, gave my little spiel about the play, why I wrote it, what I wanted to do in the world. And I never forget a young black girl stood up uh, that she's a lesbian, and she couldn't even get the words out. She just started weeping profusely. And the only word she could get out was, thank you for letting me see myself. And then in that moment, I realized that's the change that I wanna see in the world. That's my promise, meeting my gift. And it changed everything about what I define as success for the kind of work that I make. And so that's the third thing, I think, finding your gift activating change, and then redefining what success is for yourself. It is imperative that we redefine what success is. We cannot let anyone define success for us. If you wanna use your gift and activate that change, you've got to be realistic about where you're getting your pats on the backs from. If you are looking for access, our wider culture, our reviews, our peers, our donors, our artists that you idolize to celebrate you in order for you to keep doing your work you're gonna find yourself hitting up against the wall. You are gonna give your power away. It's okay to be criticized. Criticism in the right hands can be free, but giving your success to someone who is not in line with your mission is dangerous. For example, I know we want all to get, we all wanna get the men out of the chair. That's the thing here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, I would love to get the men out of the chair too. I just like the way the man looks when he's out of the chair. <laughs> he looks way more happy than when he's in the chair. <laughs> but what if success was getting someone who normally wouldn't come to the theater in one of these chairs? 
What if success was bringing more diverse audiences into these chairs, or finding creative ways to fund impossible projects? We are on the precipice of great change in our world, in our nation, and in the Bay Area. There's a lot of money flowing around you all here, but the art seems to be struggling. We can create change in ourselves and activate it and redefine success for ourselves and what good it will do in our communities if we look at ourselves, find our gifts, and begin to activate those gifts. This is where the power really lies. I believe if you find your gift and activate it, the energy from that will, will be so strong that it will attract all resources needed for you to continue to operate. We get in our way as makers. We don't believe in our abilities enough. I really believe that if you build it, they will come because your gift isn't just for you. That's why it's a gift. You are actually the giver. The gift is for us. And if you have something good to give people, believe me, they will come. Again, be the change, live the change, know that seasons change, and you will have summers, falls, and winters, but with spring comes wisdom, and it will make you much, much stronger. Lean on each other, look in on each other, treasure your gifts, for this is our home. And here people know you, they get into your bones, and apparently, you have an accent. Yeah. <laughs>